fellas, it's Raptor Jesus here. I uh, hope you guys are having a good day today. I decided to go out and to my local park today and do some talking about religion and faith and dungeon in your Dungeon and Dragons campaign. This is sort of in a similar vein to my magic video and it's sort of a complete deviation from the typical way that like clerics are handled in Dungeons and Dragons. This mostly comes about because I don't use the classes in my own homebrew. I just use the races, your race is your class, so there's a human, you know, class, a dwarf class, and so on and so forth. Kind of like the most typical BX editions, which I just really like. <laughs> so sue me. So I wanted to talk about faith in sort of the same way, in that there is, since there's no cleric class, anyone can be religious. All you have to do is give devotion to one of the gods of your pantheon, which I do think you should have a pantheon because <clears throat> you could have one god, but it's sort of boring in my opinion, and I like the idea that, yes, there's all of these allied gods working together, but they're also sort of not work. They're doing different plots and things to sort of further their own goals within their alliances bounds. So I like that. And I think uh, it's good to use uh, different pantheons. There's actually a really good video on uh, this sort of pagan ideals uh, written by the basic fantasy author. So I'll put a link in the little info theme of Bob up there. So for this example, I'm going to use one of the gods I created for my campaigns a, a while ago, called Stig, the god of righteousness. So he's sort of your typical uh, paladin-like deity, uh, god of like swords and siege engines and shields and stuff like that. There are his uh, divine attributes, or artifacts, I mean, excuse me. I like giving about four like different kind of weapon classes that each god kind of favors, or I types of items or something. You can have a god of inventions and such. And so in this case, there's different uh, ways that you can gain uh, essentially like piety with uh, with Stig, for instance. Uh, you know, and you have to swear like an oath and then do some sort of thing that would bring favor, favor to him. And in Stig's case, like one of the easiest things to do is just to be a good human. <laughs> so when you're making your gods, it's good to have your own variety of archetypes. Like I have different gods. It's the healer. I have the god of nature, of course. I actually have a goddess that's in charge of like community and making sure uh, it's prosperous and such. So you can add different tenets and faiths and ideals to it, keeping in mind the theming of your campaign. So a lot of my gods all kind of relate to dungeon crawling in some way, so those are the kinds of things I like to do. So depending on how your campaign is, you should make suitable gods to fill it. So each of these gods has their own cult that is essentially acts as uh, the power base behind uh, their followers within the overall pantheon of your campaign. And there's different ranks, which is where uh, the different piety comes in. And each of these ranks has like a, a special ability, which is being able to learn one of the various miracles that the god is in charge of. So as a person achieves these various ranks within the, the cult of a specific deity, which doesn't mean that they're limited only one, they can join as many as they feel like going to the various functions of the, on their various holy days. So the 
as a person gains ranks, they gain access to miracles. Now, there's of course six ranks I usually have, which I think is a good number. It should take a, a character a decent amount of time, unless they're they're just really grinding faith. <laughs> So they gain these various miracles, which have uh, different effects based on uh, the various clerical spells. So they're uh, spells that, uh, like in my magic video, anyone can learn spells in my system. But these these specific spells are only limited to people that are faithful. So only, essentially, clerics can learn this type of magic. But they function like other magic, uh, except for a few specific... Uh, things that um, I'll get into in a little bit the various details of how I think clerical magic should work which doesn't mean you have to use my system or anything so it would be great if you went and watched my magic video to further understand how miracles will work in this system but I'll re reiterate it a little bit here essentially instead of having slots uh, as the limit to as your resource limit uh, you have this, uh, I like to think of it like a cup, and each time you're casting a spell, you're adding spell levels of dice into this cup, and when the cup overflows, whatever dice come out, that's the dice roll for what sort of horrible mutation happens to the person that caused the cup to overflow. So, even the monsters and the non-PC spellcasters and your henchmen and your various allies are causing these the veil to thin into the other side and that's what causes these mutations to the poor soul that causes this cup to overflow. So my miracles work in the same uh, exact similar fashion. So there's not a lot of like horrible changes to the base system of D&D that I like to impose. It's just how you manage the resource I guess. And, and in this system, I like it because maybe you can try to go to other spellcasters to pass, cast very powerful spells so they get some horrible mutation that you can use to your advantage. Uh, I, I don't know. That's what I think anyway. I don't know how it will turn out because I haven't exactly been able to playtest any of this stuff. But my miracles work in a similar fashion except that uh, when you go and perform this ritual... Uh, you pay something like 10 gold pieces per level that you're trying to master of the spell and then you instantly learn this spell essentially but you're limited to how many you know I think the spells are also a, a good way to really determine a specific playstyle for each of the clerics more than just a uh, uh, or not really clerics, people who want to play religious characters, because maybe not everyone wants to play a religious character, which is totally fine. But I think it should be a base understanding that most non-PCs in your world, like the, your commoners and such, are very religious people. If you want to have a slightly medieval-esque feel to your game anyway, that's what I'm after. I don't know what you're after. <laughs> so, for instance, Stig is... Like I said, a, a very much a, a kind of a typical pla paladin playstyle. You know, he can protect from evil, he can cure wounds, and and cast light, of course. Would also uh, eventually do things like calling down flames from the heavens and creating, you know, ability to resist more fire and all of those things because he's kind of like a, a light type of god, of course, and. Every god in, in my game world uh, has a, a specific ritual that they can perform. In this case, I treat the resurrection spells like a type of ritual. It's not something that you can cast in combat. It takes a lot of like materials and effort and such in order to perform this rite to raise someone from the dead. Which is what I call, I don't use raise dead, I, use it. I just call it resurrection, so sue me. <laughs> So I, I think this uh, will make your gods uh, a little bit more authentic, maybe, than normal D&D. So I hope you guys think it's useful. Alright, I guess that's the rest of the video, fellas. 
If you have any questions, please comment down below. I hope you like my video. If you want to see more of this stuff, please uh, subscribe. I hope you guys uh, have a good game next time you play, and keep your shield arm strong, alright?